So today, I want to talk on this subject. Jesus came to turn the lights on. So we're in that season where we celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a wonderful passage of Scripture that I want you to look at with me today if you have your Bibles or it will come on the screens. What I'm going to read you first of all are the words of Isaiah found in Isaiah 8 and verse 19. And the scripture says this, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of of the living. Now here Isaiah was preaching a prophetic word that actually involved his own children. He was talking about a people who should be walking in the light, but instead they had turned their backs on the Lord and are now living in deep darkness. And as bad as things were, he began to prophesy in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, that a day would be coming, which would be about 600 or so years into the future, where Jesus would appear. And Isaiah prophesied about it in Isaiah 9, the next chapter, verses 6 and 7. You know this passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish yes, this. Amen. Now, with that passage from Isaiah as a backdrop, let's move 600 or so years into the future from that time. Jesus had just been tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and nights by the devil himself. He faced off with Satan and all of his temptations that he had to offer. And Jesus defeated the enemy with the word of God. Now that series of temptations was over and Jesus heard at the same time that John the Baptist had been thrown into prison by Herod. And the scripture says in Matthew 4 verses 12 through 17, follow along with me. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. What was Jesus doing? Well, his cousin and best friend, John the Baptist, had stirred something up in Jerusalem. And so Jesus pulled back. Galilee's about 50 or 60 miles from Jerusalem. He let things calm down a bit. And the Bible says he settled in Capernaum by the lake. That would be Sea of Galilee. Now look at this, verse 13, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, verse 14, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, I just read it to you. Now what I'm going to say here is in Matthew, but as, as the scripture says, it was originally prophesied by Isaiah 600 years earlier in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. So here it is, Matthew 4, 15. Jesus speaks, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. The Bible says in verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
Now, church, I hated to keep interrupting the text I was reading from, but I wanted to explain what Jesus was saying about light that had been prophesied over 600 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah basically said that things will get so bad and dark and satanic and demonic on the earth that the people will live in spiritual darkness 24-7. That's what Isaiah was saying. And did that happen? Indeed, it happened. The last verse in Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament, in that last verse, the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. From that time until the Bible reopens with the New Testament, 400 years between the Testaments, old and new, God said nothing to the earth. It was men and demons. It was hell on earth. But then came Jesus. Why did he come? He came to turn the lights back on. Hallelujah. How did he do that? Look with me again to Isaiah 9, verse 7, part A. Of the greatness of of his government, Isaiah writes, and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Hallelujah. Now, there are two key words that helped Jesus illuminate the future of the world when he came. Let's look at them. First, Jesus came to turn the lights on by promoting justice for all. Now, when you're living in a dark world, it means that the majority of the people have no justice. And injustice has to do with it's not fair. Living isn't fair. Education isn't fair. Work isn't fair. The pay scale isn't fair. Marriage isn't fair. The way children are treated isn't fair fair poverty isn't fair and that's why jesus came to turn the lights on and push injustice out the door and light in the door now some of you in the room are from haiti and i probably bring this nation up first because we're closest to it and i've been there so many times and like you my heart breaks for this wonderful nation I'll just give you a couple pictures here from haiti this is what many streets in Haiti look like this. I wasn't there too long ago. It still looks like that. Look at this next one. So many places throughout Haiti have tent cities. Still. And the vast majority of Haitian people live in tremendous poverty. That's wrong. That's injustice. Calcutta, India, which is where my wife's aunt and uncle served from 1955 until last year when Aunt Hulda died at 96 years of age. Look at one of, these, one of the pictures from Calcutta. That is a typical street scene of junk. That's everywhere. Nine miles by four miles is 36 square miles 16 million people live on that little piece of dirt the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Look at another picture. These are called bustees. We call them in America ghettos. 
That's what they called them in Calcutta, busties. In our worst places here in America, it's not that bad. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these busty ghettos in Calcutta, but they're all over India. Here's the prime minister. I'm sure he's a nice man. He seems to be just by looking at him. All put together, the prime minister. Let me just show you his house, just so you know. I'm sorry, but that's just not right. That's not justice. That's not fair. Look at some of the poverty of Russia. It's hard to find pictures of poverty in Russia just because they don't want people seeing it. They keep the internet clean. Here's just a group of people without work sitting in a corner. That's Russia. Here's their president looking good, feeling good. Here's one of his eight residences in Russia. That's his palace on the Black Sea. That's what's called communism. That's what's called being fair. I'll tell you what that is. That's called a couple people have billions, and the rest of the planet has nothing. All right? Um, some economists have said about this present-day president that he may have as much as $1 trillion. Yet he is presently leveling the Ukraine. That's injustice. Jesus came to turn the lights on. He came for the equality of humankind. Not everyone on the same level. I get that. But everyone able to live abundantly. That's why he came. That you might have life and life more abundantly. Whatever is not fair to a group of people is injustice for those people. I was on a call with 12 powerful religious leaders in America, most of them Christian. I was one of two white leaders on the call. But we had, I think, two Muslim leaders on the call as well. And the discussion centered around the suppression of voters' legal rights in the United States. Now, church, you know your pastor. Now, look at me. Look at me. You know I cannot stand politics. I'm not a politician. I can't stand it. I've had people say, you should run for office. I would never step down into that mess from the pulpit. I don't promote it to you. You know that. Oh, the last two or three years, people have been hammering. Stop. I'll preach the word. But when I heard that there was such real, and I've heard it for years, real injustice involved, and I knew that I was preaching on Jesus turning the lights on and making life fair and just for everyone, I had to get on that call. When I was invited all on, I said, you know me. And I told the person calling, I said, you know me. She says, no, Pastor, I know you. I know, I know. But please, just you, we need you on this call for the state of Florida. Why should it be more fair for me than for someone else when it comes to being able to vote in the United States? I'm just asking. Here's what the Old Testament prophet said. Here's what Moses said in Deuteronomy 16, verses 19 and 20. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone. Make it fair for everybody so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. Here are the words of the prophet Micah in Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. 
They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against the people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity for a nation that is unjust to its people. Some of you say, well, Pastor Rich, (laughs) you could say that about American presidents and the poor of America. And I say, yes, but at least you can vote those guys out every four or eight years. Jesus came to turn the lights on to injustice. And I'm telling you people today. The hammer is dropping all over the world. It's the hammer of God. God is moving against injustice and we're watching it on the nightly and the morning and the noontime and the afternoon time, cable news channels. In fact, we're seeing it 24-7 if you have that kind of taste for the news. But God is in it. Second. Jesus came to turn the lights on for righteous living to be the order of the day for his people. Now look at the following Bible passages with me, if you will. 1 John 1, 9, it's very familiar. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians 5, 8, I love this passage. For you were once darkness, not in darkness, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Look at this from Galatians 6, 7, and 8, very familiar. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Hallelujah. And finally, I love this passage concerning Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's right, church. God is calling us to be holy. He's calling us to live righteously for Jesus Christ. It's not easy, but for the believer, it should be normal. I can do this, but I can't do this. It's okay for me to do this, but I will not do this. You know what I'm saying today? We must individually... Listen to me. We must individually put a Holy Ghost limiter on our lives. This far and no further. And by this far, I'm not saying that we can go to the very edge of corruption and see how close we can get without going further. No. I'm saying stay away from the edge entirely. Don't let yourself get too close to the edge of corruption that it's easy for you to cross over. No. Stay as close to Jesus as you can. Run away from the edge. Run to the arms of Jesus. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 and 4, I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That's righteousness. Putting the needs of others in front of what you believe your needs are. Because we already know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus in heaven. My dear church, Jesus came to turn the lights on for his people to walk in righteousness.
one of my dear friends, Pastor Brian Houston, stepped down from being the lead pastor of the Hillsong Global Church out of Sydney, Australia, which spans the globe in many ways. And his reason for stepping down, according to the board of directors and the new lead pastor of the church, Pastor Phil Dooley, who was, for 100 years was the youth pastor of Hillsong, then moved to South Africa and planted a great church there. The reason for his stepping aside, according to the board of directors, was because of his own moral indiscretions. Now, what happened to Pastor Brian is that because of, for whatever reasons, he allowed himself to get too close to the edge of moral correctness. And it bit him. Now, I know what some of you are saying, but Pastor Rich, what is the reason on the part of our Heavenly Father? In other words, he's now shamed internationally in front of his family, his children, his grandchildren. This is something that the memory of it will not leave for the duration of his life on this planet. So you say, what is God's purpose in that? First of all, I want to say, God is way big. He is way huge. This planet is microscopic in comparison to our great God. So please get the picture of how great and huge and big our God. He is limited by nothing. These little peanut earthly rulers are nothing. God loves Pastor Brian Houston far more than God loves Pastor Brian Houston's ministry or the ministry that I offer or anyone who is in spiritual leadership positions. God loves you as an individual much greater than anything you, quote, do for him, to help him. The truth is, he lets us serve him. He lets us be a part. Because whatever you do, he lets you do it. We only serve at his allowance. We only breathe because he gave us another breath. He's way big. He wants you and me to live righteously. He wants a witness on this planet as to what Jesus looks like, how Jesus responds, what kind of pressure points move Jesus and how we should move when those pressure points come. Not legalistically, but in love with Jesus. That kind of living. So that in all things, at all times, I'm asking, what would Jesus do? What would he have me to do? Now, I'm going to make you this promise. And I've been here for 23 years, and we got churches all over that came out of this church. I'm going to say to you again what I've said for 23. I will not judge you. I'll warn you, but I'll never judge you. But I am going to judge me all the time. Day in and day out. Rich, 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 rich. Hey, hey. I'll warn you, but it's only to be So that you can keep connected to Jesus wholeheartedly. 
Jesus came to turn the lights on for righteous living. So that you don't have to be ashamed when you go to, go to bed. You may go to bed with a sore jaw from someone popping you in the mouth for telling them you loved them. You may be ridiculed for being a Christian, but you'll never be ashamed. You won't have to go to bed wondering, I wonder if I died if I'd go to heaven. No, you have peace with God because you have had the lights of righteousness turned on in your life. The rights of justice turned on in your life. Last of all, thirdly, Jesus came to turn the lights on for repentance. Now, I led off this message with scripture taken from Isaiah 9, where Isaiah prophesied 600 years ahead of time that Jesus would come to people who were living in darkness to bring about the great light from heaven. Then it says that he will come with justice and righteousness to reign forever. Then, if you remember the beginning, I moved to Matthew 12, Verse, Matthew 4, excuse me, verses 12 through 17. That is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9. But then the Bible says, after the prophecy was made, these words, Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, church, the only way to really move into the light of justice and real righteousness is through repentance. Repentance is the open door to justice and righteousness. Now, now I'm going to say this. Probably 85, well maybe at least 80% of you at least, maybe 75 or maybe 80, or in this room, uh, you've already repented. You're already living a life of justice and righteousness. However, there are some of you that just flat need to repent. Was that clear? Some of you in the room, they just flat need to repent because your injustice is showing and your unrighteousness is showing too. What's happened? No repentance. And what does that mean, Pastor Rich? That means, repentance means change your mind. Stop thinking the way you're thinking. Stop operating life the way you've been operating life. Stop putting others ahead of God. Stop putting yourself ahead of God. Start making God first. Start putting others first. Love, love, love. Get that love of money out of you. Change your mind. Jesus is coming. And he said, the scripture says, from that time on, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. For some of you today, I'm asking, what's it going to take? Will the whole world have to know of your sin? Will all of your kids be ashamed that dad, that mom was shamed because you lived too close to the edge of corruption? Will you have to be shamed in front of yourself, your family, your friends, because you thought you could get away with it? Stop! Change your mind! Repent. For the kingdom of heaven today has come to you. I want you to bow your head as we bring this message to a close. Jesus, Jesus.
I'm not going to beg. You've heard the word. The word's on you. If you're in this room, you need to repent. You need to get right with God. You need to change your mind. And you would like for me to include you in my final prayer. I want you to raise your hand right now, quickly. Raise it as high as you can right now, quickly. I see yours and 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 yours. I see yours. I see yours right here. I see yours. I see yours. I see yours. I see yours. I can't see them all, so don't just flip it up and flip it down. Let me see it. Anybody else at all? Okay, I see yours. I see yours. You can put it down. You can put it down. Maybe you haven't raised your hand. The Spirit of God is just tugging at your heart, and this will be the last time. You, you need today to change your mind. You need to repent today. Say, Pastor, please include me in this final prayer. If that's you, raise your hand. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank God. Stand to your feet, everyone standing, if you would. And we're going to sing that little chorus. Oh, God, my God, I need you. I need him. Oh, God, my God, I need you. They're going to sing that. And if today you need to repent, if today you'd like for me to include you in my final prayer, then I'm going to ask you, when they start to sing, Oh, God, my God, and you hear the words come out of their mouth, I'm going to ask that in the overflow, the back, across the front, I want you to step to the aisle nearest you immediately and come and stand at this altar. I want to pray with you personally before you go home today. You say, Pastor, I can't do that. People will see me. That is the whole point. There's something about walking away from where you were to where you want to be in Jesus that will make all the difference in your life. And if you are serious, I want you to step from where you are right now as we sing it together. Come and join me here. Hallelujah. God for honest hearts today reach your hands in the direction of this altar if you will I want everybody at the altar but everybody in the building to pray this prayer out loud with me would you pray it out loud dear Jesus I've sinned I'm not proud of it but I admit it today I lay my sin down take it I pray I don't want it anymore thank you for turning the lights on. Turning the lights Thank, on. You Thank you that my life, that my life can, be can be lit with the righteousness, with the righteousness and the justice of God. Justice Today, of God. Lord, I yield my life completely to you. I ask, I ask that you would accept me, you accept me into your wonderful family. Your wonderful in, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.